So this lecture is going to be on chapter one of the Interaction Design book. Um, so this PDF is up on Canvas. Please download it and um, listen to me through this video as I go through chapter one, and then please read chapter one at your own pace. So chapter one is the basics of interaction design, um, starting to define the essence of it, what and what what characteristics, what qualities can we start to gauge it on um, on a scale uh, from good to poor? Um, how to how to relate interaction design to a bigger idea of, of the user experience? How is the user experiencing your application? And interaction design is one of the major through fares with the user with the application. Um, and then how to start thinking about the two in tandem. So I'm going to move to page seven. So I have it on a two page layout. You can have it on a one page layout. I know the quality of the PDF isn't the best, um, but at least it's a textbook for free. If you care to, you can, you can buy, um, they've obviously gone past this edition, um, but you can uh, buy it from Amazon if you care to. So th this chapter, so this book is um, a little bit older, but um, the ideas and the terminology and the essence of the field are the same. Um, and a lot of this idea of interaction design and user experience wow. design is coming from fields that were before the computer. So you can start to think that uh, the personal computer started to grab a foothold maybe in the 70s, but really became uh, larger or more prevalent in our mass society starting in the 80s. And so the theories and the ideas and the fields that came together um, to form uh, human computer interaction or user experience or software design you know, we're only in 2020, so they've only, you know, been forming for like 40 years, which might sound like a long time to you. Um, uh, but for an actual field of, of, of human endeavor and knowledge, um, like computer science or electrical engineering or physics or math, you know, a lot of these fields have been around for hundreds or thousands of years as they're refined. So, since these ideas of, I'll just say HCI, human computer interaction, might be like the largest field, largest bubble to think of in terms of interaction design, and user experience design, um, and user interface design, and so on. Um, they, these ideas have only been forming for like 40 years. So that's young for um, a field of industry, of training, of, of, of how to identify these professionals in this um computer system engineering and design. So they borrow a lot from industrial design, mechanical design. So you're going to see a lot of these examples talking about, in this case, a voicemail system. So how e easy is it to use through a touch tone phone? Um, and this is uh, an, this answering machine developed by some industrial design student. They're talking about it's such an interesting, it's so different and foreign yet it's easy to pick up, it's intuitive, and it's fun, or what we call engaging these days. Um, so it's, it's all about kind of giving you a framework, uh, an area to start thinking about good design as you start to look at competing software and as you try to design a small prototype for yourself. So this was like a voicemail system. This goes through a remote-controlled device, so these large... TV ones that have been shrunken down a lot, but you see how many buttons are on it. It gets confusing. Uh, I'm sure um, at home with your parents, you know, if your TV has like two or three remotes and all of them have like 10, 20, 30 buttons and they ask you, they just don't understand and you have to kind of like reset the TV for them every month or what have you. This is the idea of a poor user experience. And then these are analog devices. These are coming from industrial design and, um, and it's useful to look at because a lot of the ideas like the mouse, the keyboard, touchscreen, um, hand controllers, um, game pads, joysticks, you know, all these came um, from this field. Uh, so I'm going to be just be like doing like a quick talk and lectures. I move through chapter one, just kind of ground you in and then you can read it at your speed. So 
it's very easy to look at something physical to start to break it apart. Like the idea of it, is it easy to use? Is it fun? Is it really hard to turn this dial? Is it whatever, you know, the, it's a lot of it. Uh, it's subjective. It's uh, based on the user's experience. And a lot has to do with how they're feeling their emotion side and uh, the, the logical side, their analytical side too. Is it easy to figure out and use to express themselves, express their thoughts or express their actions? Um, and so as you get into the, the field of user experience and interaction design, you talk a lot about the user's emotions and the user's analytical side, the, you know, the generic two sides of the brain and how this device, whether it's, a piece of hardware or a piece of software, it's still, there's an interface. Even software, there's still, you have to build some type of graphical or audio or, or some type of um, interface from the computer to the human to understand, for the human to understand what the computer is doing and the human to express commands to change what the computer is doing. In either case, this all kind of gets wrapped up in this idea of interaction design a person interacting with a hard or soft device, a piece of hardware or through the software, but through the software, you're, you're still going to have a translation layer like a mouse, a keyboard, voice commands with a speaker. There still is, you know, some piece of hardware where a translation of the interaction happens. And that's why I call it a user interface. Even for a piece of software with some graphics displayed on the monitor, it's still an interface between the human and the computer. And whether it's just a bunch of lights on the screen or a remote control like this, we can still have a general idea, a general design terminology and thinking to say, is this good or is this bad? And how do we improve? Which is really the most important question. So here's some other novel products and read through it and, and try to come up with your own um review your own feedback, try to develop your language, your design language. Usually you have a, a knee-jerk reaction about something and you just have a generic term. Oh, this is good, this is bad. Well, we have to go a little bit deeper. Why do you think that? And so you're going to have to start to develop that knowledge to allow you to communicate a little bit more descriptive you know, um, verbiage as to why you think something is subjectively good or bad and how to improve it. Um, so here's a big diagram of interaction design. Here's all the fields that are touching it or they're being borrowed from and being used in here. And the same as last week as I was talking about learning science, you have the same thing. Like learning science is just borrowing and overlapping with like 10, 20 different fields. It's a very hybrid nature. And HCI and interaction design and UX all have that heavy overlap with all these social sciences and industrial designing and engineering fields that had to kind of figure these things out for hundreds of years before computers came along. And then there's different actors or different people involved in interaction design. Usually there's the, the, the team, the designers, the developers, the project managers, the business leaders, managers trying to figure out um, the user researchers getting feedback from users with play testing and user testing um, and all these people coming together in their different roles and different languages, uh, different ways to communicate that you have to understand what they're saying and how this all comes together in a team effort to build software. And so consultants and then here's a big, the, so the user experience. Um, and here we're talking a more of a generic, a generalized field or of design, like uh, then interaction design. We're not talking about the direct interface interaction between the human and the computer, and that relationship they have defined solely with the uh, human giving input to the computer. The computer giving output to the human, the human receiving their input from the computer's output, the computer receiving their output from the human's input in that constant cycle, that interaction. This is an even broader idea of the user experience. So user experience design, UX design and research. So we're looking at the broader context from the user side. 
and we talk about ideas of products. So software can be is viewed as a product, and then all these physical objects like ketchup bottles and armchairs are considered products. And what is the user experience of this product? And how do we even go about thinking about it and uh, changing it and reviewing it and analyzing it and getting feedback from users and, and actually listening to them and actually getting good, solid data to improve and iterate their product. And again, software falls into this cycle as well. And there's going to go, he's going to talk a lot about uh, Apple products because back in the eighties and nineties and two thousands, you know, they were often uh, the big leader and, and, and UX and the experience of the user. And again, that includes interaction, but it's beyond that. It's, when I use this product, in this case, uh, we're looking at an advertisement for the iPod. I uh, Hopefully it's not too out of date. Maybe some of you have no idea what it is, but it's like, I guess maybe the first cool digital music player. Before that was the Walkman, the, the analog equivalent with cassette tapes. Um, and there were digital music players before the iPod um, from different manufacturers but it was really Apple that made the whole experience. So it doesn't, it looks cool. You feel good. You feel like you're top of the world. You'll pay that extra money because it's like a social status thing to have an Apple product. This is all part of the user experience it has no idea of interaction with it. It just looks cool. It's white. It's got this machine rounded corners. It's like white or gray where everything else had maybe a duller black and, um, the, it is just so intuitive with the thumb controls, which is interaction design. And it had these, it was just so easy to cycle through your songs. And they would, users would just play with that um, clockwise and counterclockwise rotation with their thumb. It almost um, has like a video game pad just and cycle through their songs because it's just so new to them and so easy to use. And they just got it. So you, you see that there were some elements of interaction design I was talking about. But then it gets pulled to a broader idea um, that this thing just makes people feel good. I carry it in my pocket. It's small. The battery life is long. It's not doesn't overheat. You can put a thousand and thousands of songs on it. It's so easy to plug into my Mac and this little file explorer window pops up and it just shows me my music right away. And iTunes is so easy to use. Um, which is, you know, the affiliate piece of software that works with the iPad, uh, the iPod back in the day. And now we're, it's more of like a holistic um, um, sense, uh, journey for the user. The, their, their emotional feelings and attachment to this product because it delivers these services and impacts their lifestyle in certain ways. Um, and... This is what we're talking about. We talk about experience. And the term is becoming more popular these days with the, the immersive technologies of AR, VR. They talk about it's as, it as an experience because it's so immersive. You put on this headset, it's like you're experiencing a reality here. It's different than, you know, this device gives you a different experience of reality than you normally would. So the same with other products. And um, this is what they mean. I think you can think when you talk about UX design, user experience, you can think of the product and how it impacts the user's life. Does it solve problems? Does it make things easier? Like the cell phone. I use it to go navigate. The GPS is so essential. I don't have to really worry about just jumping a car and where am I supposed to be going? You know, it has a big impact on my life. And that's the user experience. The interaction design is turning on the cell phone, swiping the code so it knows it's me, uh, finding the icon for Google Maps or whatever mapping product I'm using, and then how do uh, how does the keyboard pop up? How do I enter out the address? What's autofill acting like? Is it really easy to use? Is it looking up more New Jersey addresses where I am, or is it just looking up addresses all over the nation, which doesn't make as much sense to me, and it's annoying. So these are ideas of um, um, the user experience, and then I'm drilling down into that interaction design, that back and forth. That you can, when you talk about how it's impacting the user in a broad sense in their life, that's user experience. And when you talk about that back and forth, how this product, the software, um, the, the micro interactions, the micro, we'll, we'll talk about that later, but the, the, the 
micro details of how the user uses the product, the back and forth that constantly goes in that input output loop between the person, the user and the computer, that's the interaction design. So there are two overlapping, interesting ideas about design, and you're just going to have to be aware that interaction design, you can kind of think of as a subset of user experience design. And we have this idea of user interface, uh, user experience design. We have this idea of user interface design, which actually is just the graphical design and how it moves back and forth, the, the, the graphics on the, the screen when you're interacting. So you have interaction design, we have user experience design, and um, visually, we're not going to talk too much about visual design, but we have this idea of user interface design. And then these are three design elements or fields, and then you can, a broader context is human-computer interaction, which um, it's kind of interchangeable with UX. Uh, it it's... It really depends. So you'll notice in a lot of academic fields that terms will might morph and change and mean different things. It's just the way that language naturally evolves in, in any culture. And um, HCI used to be the term that you'd think of with UX, and um, it's still used a lot. And it and it you can think of the term of human computer interaction encompasses all like the theory and frameworks. Um, necessary to talk about user experience and interaction design. Um, so the process of interaction design, and so identifying the needs, establishing requirements for the user experience. Notice that here now we're, the process of interaction design is kind of within user experience. Developing alternative designs to meet the always having backup plans and alternatives because you just it's nothing works out right away. The words, the what they call the wicked problem. Uh, I should find that article, but you think you know what you're doing until you test it on real people, and it, you're always going to find that things are a lot harder to solve and optimize for um, when you kind of leave your comfort of just trying to make stuff for yourself or making stuff in the lab. Um, making real software products in the real world is, is very hard and building it interactive versions of design so they can be communicated and assessed. That's prototyping. We're going to get into that. And, and evaluation metrics. How do you know if um, what you're doing, elements of what you're doing are good or bad, how to improve them? So we're going to go through these cycles in this class. We kind of phrase it as like, we do our research to find a problem. We do our design to find the solution. And we build a prototype to build that solution and test it. And those beyond this class, you just keep doing that. You keep improving, improving, and testing until you um, have something in a very refined way. So usability goals, we're going to use this, these ideas a lot when um, there's going to be a later video this week um, evaluating some competitor educational technologies. And we're going to use these usability metrics or goals to kind of talk about other pieces of software to help you, guide you when you have to evaluate your own competitors that you're, um, for your little educational space you're developing for. So usability um, is a term that's talking about um, easy to learn, effective to use, and enjoyable from the user's perspective. So we're talking about how easy and comfortable and just fun is an interactive product. So again, everything I was kind of talking about with the iPod, um, we kind of wrap this up in this term of usability. Is it quick to learn? Is it effective? Meaning it's quick and simple to do what you want to do. Whatever your goals and tasks are, you can implement and execute on them in an easy fashion. And is it enjoyable from the user's perspective? So enjoyment, fun. These days we really call it engagement. And especially in learning science, we, say, we usually use the terms efficacy and uh, engagement. So efficacy, um, it basically means effectiveness. So if you look at this list down here, effective to use, effectiveness. 
how quick and um, gets to the point. It's not cumbersome. It's not a waste of resources and energy for a person to do what they need to do with this interactive product, with this piece of software. In learning science or educational technology, you'll see the term efficacy a lot. And it means a very similar thing, um, but it means if um, how the ability to perform a task to a satisfactory level or an effective or an expected level of completion. So how well can you perform a task with whatever this tool is, efficacy? How well can you learn something with this educational tool, with this educational software? So it's... It's very similar. It's just, again, different fields have different terminology. And so in learning science, educational technology, they'll say efficacy. But here we can use effectiveness. That's fine. Is it effective? And you might argue that um, efficacy actually means both effectiveness and efficient. So effective to use and efficient to use. It's efficient on the resources and the time. So it's effective. It gets the job done. It's efficient it's low um, use of resources, of time, of using your cognitive abilities, your mental energy to do this as opposed to something else. It's more efficient. So effectiveness, efficiency are some aspects of usability, of the goals of knowing something is usable. Is it safe to use? So again, this is coming from industrial design and another more... Um, physical product fields. So um, you can say that um, safe to use, you could talk about like ergonomics. Does a person have to like hunch over the computer? Is it going to give them back problems, wrist problems? Um, actually in VR, safe to use comes up a lot, virtual reality, because you need to put the headset on. How is it affecting the eyes? You kind of have these mini screens really close to the eyes. Are they getting headaches or migraines or uh, aspects of vertigo, what have you. But again, when, as you build software, you don't really have to think about safe to use, but it's there. So um, sometimes it, it might actually be a factor. Having a good utility, so a good utilization, a good use of the user's time, um, which you know has overlap with efficiency and effectiveness, um, more with efficiency, but is it a good utility? Is it a good like, um, return on investment? So is it effective? Does it get the job done? Is it efficient? Is it a low use of resources compared to other methods? Does it have good utility? Is there a good return of the amount of effort I put in to have to learn this piece of software? Do I get a lot back from my perspective, from the user's perspective? Again, that's subjective. Um, is it easy to learn, learnability? So usually that deals with the tutorial and the intro. Can you pick it up fast? Um, are your mechanics, are your interactions uh, quick to learn, easy to master, or what have you? And memorability, is it easy to remember? So learnability and memorability. Is it quick to learn, to start using? Uh, but can I return back to your piece of software in a day, a week, a month, and can I just remember it? Can I just pick it back up, or do I have to go through the tutorial again? So um, in learning science, um, learning metrics, yes, like we'll test before a session of using a piece of software, we'll, we'll test before and after with like multiple choice or some type of knowledge question, see if your knowledge changed, and then memorability we call retention. How well does the knowledge retain in the user's mind? So then we'll do the same knowledge test like a day, a week, a month, a year later against different types of teaching methods or educational technologies. And we'll see if um, certain ways, um, certain ways of learning involving the mind or the, or the, or the body uh, produce a, a longer memory. They, they retain the knowledge longer and they don't need to be trained again or as frequently. So this all has to do with usability in a general sense for software, but as you see, a lot of these terms translate really well into educational software where it's a, uh, learning metrics and retention metrics and um, engagement are easy to use and fun. Uh, here's all the 
you paragraphs about each aspect of usability, but so spend your time on this section really well because this is how we're going to be reviewing competing software and you're going to have to do the same in an activity which leads up into your your sprint one your research deliverable so user experience goals so we have this idea of usability goals um, then we have this idea of user experience goals so user experience is different than usability. Something is usable. We're talking about what we just talked about. It's more direct, uh, more succinct. User experience goals can be more broad. And again, we're talking about how like a product, an interactive product is affecting a user's experience at that moment, emotionally or analytically and, and long-term, how it impacts their life. Like I can't go on road trips without using Google Maps it's too easy for me. Um, it's, I need some type of navigation system with my car or with my phone. It's, um, and these, these are terms here that, that you could talk about. It's helpful. It's motivating, right? These are these larger um, goals or more long-term impact to the user's life or the user's experience. So you can kind of say that they're very subjective, they're emotional, this is why we have to evaluate target. You have to be very specific who we're making the software for and how do we evaluate them and their, their goals. And so how do we know if we were successful with our target with, when we're building the software? And some of these might be part of what you're trying to evaluate and some of them might be not. This is just a big list. So the product is satisfying, it's enjoyable, it's engaging, it's pleasurable, it's exciting to the user. A lot of these have very similar nature here. Helpful, it's motivating, it's cognitively stimulating and supportive of creativity. So these are veins of more the mental processes where over here there's more like the, the fun factor, the engagement, but these are more of the cognitive nature. So you can read through this. And so here we have some design principles, um, just some general guidelines. So the most common ones, visibility, feedback, constraints, consistency, and affordances. Let me see if they talk about each one. Yeah, they kind of do. So um, visibility, how easy is it to see whatever the intent is or the, the different options of your, of your interaction design? Uh, feedback, how how quickly and easy is it for to understand the user, whatever they interacted with was responsive, it did whatever on the back end. Because when you're changing all these this data, these numbers on the back end of the computer system, the user doesn't see it. How do you provide them feedback with the button click, a change of color, um, something, some, some, there has to be something uh, usually visual or something changes of a visual nature or of, in their user interface to in the show what has happened based on their interaction. Constraints means you're, you're always going to have to be, um, your d idea of a design has to be guided and constrained by some factor. You can't just answer everything. You can't look everywhere. You can't solve everything. Your design is going to be all over the place if you're not scoped down. You need constraints. That's why we go through a research phase. That's why we go through a identifying the problem phase, um, we need constraints. If you don't have blinders on, your just attention is all over the place, your solutions are all over the place, it's a mess. Like you want clean, effective identification of what you're trying to solve, clean, effective solutions focused, very laser sharp focused on that problem you define, and then that leads or should lead to a very effective implementation of the prototype. And then consistency. Everything should do the same. Whatever you design in your interface, and in your interaction, user experience, it should be the same across the whole uh, product. The same interaction shouldn't give different results back to the user at different parts of the product. It'll confuse them. Um, affordance is this kind of innate 
attribute of um, the user just kind of knows what the point of this thing is. So uh, a mouse, it's before you've even used it, it's kind of shaped like your hand. There's these kind of places that you're fit comfortably for your your index and your middle finger. Um, you can kind of see that where you place your finger, it's open on the sides in front. It kind of put you, and you can kind of see that you can push it. Um, and so this is the affordance of a mouse. It kind of intuitively supposed to do. It gives you a clue. All right, and then this gives you some guidelines how to def how to use these. These are general principles that are just help to guide you because when you first design something, you're like, oh, my God, what am I building? How do I do it? Well, here's some general ideas. Here's some general principles that usually have been found to produce good results. Um, so you should try to follow these if, if you just don't have a, an initial starting point of idea of what you want to do. All right, that was Chapter 1. Um, I'm going to go review some competing apps and go, uh, I'm going to do a, a video on chapter three and we have some other stuff to cover for the week.